Hi, everybody. I am Carrie Schaefer. I am delighted to be guest hosting today on Authors on the Air and to have this opportunity to speak with our fabulous guest today, Lowell Coffville. Hi, Lowell. Lowell is the best-selling author of nine books and an award-winning veteran investigative reporter. His research has taken him everywhere, from the president's private living quarters in the White House to the dangerous confines of urban dope dens. Caulfield's three crime novels have explored diverse characters and settings that range from a Detroit shakedown crew in Marker to the glitzy, corrupt underworld of the National Football League in Toss, which he co-authored with former Super Bowl quarterback Boomer Essieson. His five nonfiction crime books have covered a monstrous homicidal patriarch in the New York Times best selling House of Secrets, a pair of female serial killers in Forever in Five Days, and a calculating criminal justice instructor who tried to design the perfect crime with the murder of his TV anchorwoman wife in Eye of the Beholder. Caulfield's first true crime book, Masquerade, the story of a gross point psychologist's deadly double life, was a national bestseller. He has appeared in a dozen documentaries about his books, and has written and produced documentaries for the Discovery Channel and CNBC and has adapted his first book, Masquerade, to film. He now lives in Los Angeles, where he writes feature films and creates shows for television. Wow, that's quite a career. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. So, um, Lowell, tell us just briefly a little bit about um, Below the Line. And do you have a copy you can show off to those of us who yeah, are on it's got, video. it's got a great cover too it does i love how little e drops down below the you know and 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 when they designed the cover they said that the book is really kind of a fun read it's got some you know humor and kind of that elmore leonard style of uh -huh. humor and so they wanted the cover to reflect that fun so i mean it's got it's got some dark stuff in it you know there's murders and things like that but it's you know, I always work towards the great line and the, you know, the humorous thing. But what, what Below the Line is about is a former Detroit homicide cop. And, I, and I've, I've known many. Uh, gets, uh, gets drawn out to Hollywood to become a, a consultant, uh, you know, a law enforcement consultant for film and television. And, and that's the way the business works, too. There's, they, they hire former police officers, former FBI people to try to get the details right or get ideas for their scripts. And he has a couple of good years, but then he gets on kind of tough times and gets becomes clinically depressed until a former producer he worked with calls him to his house and says, hey, I got a great show that I want you to work on. But first, I got a favor to ask. I want you to find this woman and her child who has come up missing in LA for a friend of a friend. And that's the setup of the book and what that, that skip trace, that search that he, he goes on takes him into some really, uh, you know, dark places and kind of the underbelly of the business. And at the same time, there's a, a former mafia uh, hired gun who is also searching for the same wife and kid and there's a ton of hidden, hidden agendas in this book, very much like Hollywood works. There's a lot of hidden agendas, right. a lot of false promises, a lot of twists and turns, and a, a lot of kind of crazy people. For sure. I love um, the cover copy, the back cover copy, the second paragraph. This, this hooked me. I'm going to be uh, reading this, by the way. I haven't had a chance to get my hands on it yet, but I will. Um, when a corrupt Hollywood producer, an ex-cop with a conscience, and a career criminal without one all have the same quarry, trouble is bound to ensue. Um, I, I was in right there on, on that little bit right there. It's kind of like, you know, if these three people walk into a bar, a little bit of a, a <laughs> premise there. Um, I really, I'm super curious about one thing. I, it's come to my attention that it's been like, you have written all of these very, very many books, but it's been 20 years. Is, is that right? Since you yeah, last you know, wrote and published a book. So yeah. what made you, you know, do this now? Well, I used to write a book every year. I was either writing nonfiction or uh, uh, fiction when I was living in Michigan, outside of Detroit, actually outside of Ann Arbor, Michigan. And uh, I got sucked out here in the Hollywood myself on a similar kind of offer <laughs> to, stop to adapt one of my books to film. 
And uh, I was a Great Lakes surfer, and the surfing's so good out here on the Pacific, and my daughter's an actress, and she was out here. So I decided to come out here and write the screenplay out here and develop some personal relationships with some of the people, and I ended up staying. And um, so I spent 20 years working in uh, film and television, mainly uh, uh, creating shows and writing pilots that sold. I made good money doing it, uh, but they didn't get shot. They didn't ended up on TV. This happens a lot. It's, right. It's I, really I understand the, indus the industry is crazy like that. So yeah, there's really no actual odds. shows out there with your name on them that we could all go watch right now. Right, right. So this went on for like 20 years yeah. and uh, then COVID hit and um, everything kind of shut down. And I thought, God, you know, I miss writing. I, I miss novel writing and book writing. And it was a tough transition back because um, in film and television, you can't get inside the character's heads. You know, you, you have to show kind of what's going on or what they're thinking, but not, you, you, can't, you can't have point of view. Whereas a novel, you're, you, you're, you're in the character's head and have point of view. And that was a tough transition back. Once I finally got the hang of it, I decided to take a lot of my experiences and kind of roll them through this, this former homicide cop. I mean, I'm not a former homicide cop, but many of my experiences, he experiences uh, in, in the book. So I had mm -hmm. 20 years of, of, of research. Plus what you're just really grounded in that whole, I mean, you've experienced all of those things. I imagine the duplicity of the, the, the movie producers and um, just the sort of environment of um, LA and the, and the film world. I mean, I've literally had a producer, you know, come up to me and say, you know, this town is going to snatch you up and take you right to the top. You know how many careers I've made here and I'm going to make yours. And of course, nothing happens. You know, Did you but, believe him back in the no, day? No, no, I, no. <laughs> I don't believe anything, actually. You know what I believe? I believe my name on a check. That's yeah. what I believe. And, uh, and, I, and I did, you know, I had a, a, a good film made, um, uh, Stockholm, which is uh, starring Ethan Hawke. I developed that whole project. That is the bank robbery in 1973 in Stockholm, Sweden, that created the term the Stockholm syndrome. Oh, and wow. uh, so again, that was something based more, you know, in reality. Uh, I, I like to work with reality. I don't need to make stuff up. All I got to do is walk around and uh, see things and, and observe things. And I think the uh, good novelists do that. They, they do, although I, I am still interested, you know, I'm, I'm not quite clear why a novel when you decided to go back to writing a book and not, you know, another, you've written a number of true crime books as well. So. Well, first of all, to, um, the steam has gone out of true crime. I mean, when I was writing true crime, it was hardcover and I was like one of 10 of the top true crime writers, you know, in America, not to blow my own horn, but that's, sure. you know, uh, and we wrote in hardcover we would get enough advances so that we could do research for a year. Mm -hmm. And because uh, uh, to, to write good true crime, you can attend a trial, but that's just like getting a Rolodex of names you need to go interview later. Mm -hmm. And um, but after OJ, uh, uh, publishers got the idea that, you know, why are we hiring these like really great writers like Jack Olson and uh, Joe McGinnis and all that to do these books and paying them all this money? When we when these are story driven books, they say, or crime driven books, let's just hire some guy that works for AP and give him twenty thousand dollars, and he's going to essentially you know rewrite everything that that he saw. And I I can't write true crime for that. That's number one reason. I right. I need the money, you know, right. the advance. The second thing is, I was burnt out, man. I I went into clinical depression after my last true crime book, House of Secrets. It was so dark. I lost all that. faith in humanity. Right. Uh, it it was it was, uh, you know, I ended up having to seek professional help and actually go on antidepressants for a while to even be able to write that book. Sure. The funny thing about House of Secrets is I was so disgusted with the story after doing researching it for I think almost two years. I only knocked out. 
I think 28 pages in two months. And I'm usually a six pages to eight pages a day kind of writer. Right. And I called the publisher and I said, forget it. I'm not writing it. But I had a book deal. And they said, well, we're going to sue you unless you can. Right. <laughs> I went on the antidepressants and suddenly came out of the depression. And I wrote that book in two months, and which was incredible writing speed, 10, 15 pages a day. Cause I just didn't want anything to do with it. Right. And uh, I said, look, I don't want to see the cover. I don't want to see the book, you know, just take it, whatever. And about a year and a half later, like I Googled my name and I see my name in the New York times. I'm going like, why am I in the New York times? I go there and I was on the bestseller list. <laughs> and you didn't even know. So, oh my I God. Called the publisher, I called my editor, Paul Dennis. I said, Paul, I'm on the bestseller list, New York Times. He goes, yeah, I know. I said, why didn't you tell me? He says, you said you didn't want to hear anything. They were all laughing. Oh, and my God. Me a dozen roses and whatever. But, but that's why I stopped doing true crime. I, and I don't want to, you know, in, my, in a novel, I can explore existential things and that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I can make it come out the way I want. Right, right. You yeah. know, it, it gets really rough when you're doing true crime. Uh, because like I'd be, I spent a hundred hours with a psychopath who's right. murdered all oh these people God. and I'd yeah. be there on a Wednesday interviewing him every week in prison. And then yeah. on Thursday, I'm with the family of his victims and they're crying right. and they're, right. I'm, 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 I'm comforting them, holding them. And after a while, you begin to think, who's the psychopath? I mean, right. I, I'm two different people here. Right. And so that gets to be really right. tough. Right. I'll tell you just one more little quick story. Yeah. A uh, gal I was dating at the time, we went and saw the movie True, about Truman Capote doing In Cold Blood, starring Philip Seymour Hoffman. And that, it, you know, that book takes this big toll on him, you know, he, he, emotionally and everything else. And so after the movie the credits, my uh, girlfriend turned to me and said, uh, was that what it was like for you? And I said, yeah, try five times. Yeah. You know, he only did one. Right. So. Right. Well, the thing about writing a book in 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 the in show business, which is what it is, it's not show friendship; it's show business. I mean, some some people true. think it's show friendship. You got to know it's show business. Absolutely. And, uh, uh, I think it was the agent Swifty Lazar said, uh, "Hollywood's the only place where your best friends stab you in the chest." But uh, <laughs> uh, the interesting thing about it is, it, when the when my agents start taking the book out to different publishers, the rejections would come back, and they said these Hollywood people are not making any sense. Their logic is flawed. And, you know, they're doing things that, that, that no, no normal person would do. And so we, we can't get excited about that. And I thought, that's the whole point of the book. That's what makes these characters kind of fun. Right. And that's where the fun element comes in. You saw that same kind of thing in Get Shorty, which my mentor, Elmore Leonard, uh, I was good friends with Dutch. His friends called him Dutch. Uh, did in, in, in Get Shorty. And he wrote that book after he got taken down the Primrose Path out here for a couple of weeks and nothing happened of it. And he came back and he wrote Get Shorty, the same kind of thing. Right, right. Absolutely. So do you have another, you know, are you planning another book? Is there going to be more of, you know, this main character, a series or do you well, have anything a, else you're working on? this is an interesting on? character, Edwin Blake, you know. Uh -huh. the, uh uh, former Detroit homicide cop, Edwin Blake. And, you know, we're in a novel. You, you got to get the name right. I, I, you know, once I have a name, I can write a character. But sometimes it takes weeks for me to find a name. But Edwin Blake and his friends call him Eddie. Eddie, what the hell are you doing here? You know, uh, and he sounds like a cop, you know, so yes. you, you got to have that name. Yeah, He's such a good character and he's so conflicted. And he, he at times desperate, but he ends up always he ends up doing the right thing, you know, and uh, he, I, when I designed him, I thought this is a good series character. So Eddie has been knocking on my door lately and saying, you know, I want to do another book. So I think good. I might do another one with him yeah. and, and develop him more and uh, take him into some other interesting places. Um, but a couple of weeks ago, or a couple of months ago, I was out at a place called the Salton Sea. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's in California. It's this giant inland lake that's very salty. That used to be this, uh, uh, it used to be this like world class resort, but it only lasted about five years. Then all the fish died, and the fish started stinking, and the resorts went to hell. And now it's sort of this dystopian area. And I was so fascinated with it. I said, I gotta get, I gotta put a scene out here or something. So you get ideas that way. 
you know, oh, by, yeah, by traveling around and meeting people. And, yeah. Right. Well, and you've met so many people. I, here's the other thing I'm thinking is like all of those interviews you did with the both the psychopaths and the families, um, and not to mention the investigative um, reporting that you've done. I mean, you have to have an absolutely fantastic understanding of human nature by now, you know, that it would be kind of second nature almost for you to be able to create well-developed characters and you know that just kind of flow into you yeah and a lot of things about you know in, in investigations and and I, I get like i said i like to get the details right you know sure. uh, uh uh i don't know if i said this before but uh the, writing a novel is is actually writing a giant lie it's right. the, the greatest lies that are ever told uh but it as every psychopath knows in order to get a uh a lie that's believable you have to have all the details have right. to be truthful right. and so i really work hard on the research end and get it you know my books have the real restaurants the real locations i don't make up like imaginary cities or right. you know things like that very different than me i'm always making stuff up just because details are hard for me but um that's one of the things i love about uh kellerman's books for example in, in la is he always takes you to these amazing restaurants and neighborhoods hoods and place yeah and sometimes the restaurants you know, close very... <laughs> you know while, while yeah. you, after your book is published and sometimes they're they become very popular but i've I, one couple of the locations in the book closed between the time the book was uh you know submitted and published uh so there's a little bit of a historical well, record for a couple of them you have no control. <laughs> you yeah. have no control over that. The opening right. and closing of restaurants. So that's great. Um, if people are trying to find you and follow you online, do you have a current social media presence that we can tap into? Well, I have, I have a website, lowellcaulfield.com. That's C-A-U-F-F-I-E-L. No relation to Holden Caulfield. Uh, and so it's lowellcaulfield.com. You can get a lot of information there. Okay. I have a Facebook page, uh, author's page, but I don't pay a lot of attention to it. Uh, right. I think the best thing is to go to the you go to my website, and the links are there. I've also got a YouTube channel I just started called Lowell Caulfield's Primary Sources. I used to write for Rolling Stone and Cream Magazine back in the 70s. I've still got these tapes from famous musicians like Jeff Beck and Stephen Stills and that, and I'm starting to transcribe the tapes or actually – uh, put the tapes into YouTube so people can hear these interviews back in the seventies with me as just a young guy, like, you know, interviewing them. And uh, there's some, be, be some material on that too. All those links are on my website. Wow. So that's fascinating. So you interviewed musicians and I think we have to talk about that too. If um, any of you are watching the video version of, of this, you will see guitars in the background in um, little you obviously have an interest in music that goes beyond interviewing musicians. Yeah, I spent uh, in Detroit, I had a blues band called the Progressive Blues Band. Uh, we, we were on the scene there for about 25 years. Uh, when I moved out to L.A. here, though, I stopped. Uh, uh, I, there's not there's blues musicians out here, but not like my Detroit pals. Right. And, and I sort of, you know, you start to mellow out down here, which doesn't make any sense because there's nothing mellow about <laughs> it's L.A. Not it's mellow, insane. No. You know, I mean, you're fighting traffic all the time. There's a line in the book that says, you know, people fighting, you know, fighting to the death over one car length, you know. I mean, it, it, the, the so-called laid back L.A. lifestyle ends at the pavement. But culturally, you start to, and something about the sunshine and the palm trees and that start to mellow out. So I've been, I'm now playing more, uh, crossover jazz or smooth jazz uh it kind of in that thing and i have an obsession with buying guitars too i'm up to 12 now and do you, uh, do you have a favorite are you allowed no, to have they a all have guitar? a different voice you know i right. mean the fenders tend to sound more feminine the gibson sound more masculine right and uh you know it's it it's it i try i have to kind of avoid guitar shops if i go in and i pick up one and the way it feels and everything. And it just says, you know, I'm going to buy it. So. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so in, um, in below the line, does any of the music make it into the book at all? Below the line. Do I have any, uh, uh, no, I don't have any musicians in there. I don't have any, I have a, uh, the girlfriend of Edwin Blake is a former roller derby queen and she plays a key part in this book. She's in recovery. 
uh, you know, from uh, alcoholism and drug addiction. She became addicted to uh, painkillers from all the injuries as a roller girl. Oh, and uh, and she's sober and she's sort of his conscience. Uh, uh -huh. And uh, all my books tend to feature, my novels tend to feature uh, 12, somebody's in a 12 step group. Uh -huh. uh, you know, and that comes from my own experience. I've been sober, clean and sober for God, 38 years. So that I pick up a lot of material there, too. So, oh, that's there's great material there. I think, you know, everybody has a story and the stories that you hear in a 12 step group are fascinating. And then yeah, you, right. you get to modify them for your own personal, you know, interesting. One more thing um, before we go. I, I'm, I've been holding on to this and thinking it over Um novel being the greatest lie that you can tell and it's also in so many ways i feel like novels often kind of get more at the truth in in many ways than any other form of of writing as well because it's the soul of the book might be true even though you're crafting a whole great big lie yeah you, I, you know it, you, we're getting into themes now and yeah. uh, you know and you you put your protagonist into a situation where there are op many obstacles and how he overcomes those obstacles reveal his character but i think a novel's a lot like a screenplay when you get to the end of that second act he's kind of had his ass kicked really hard right. and there's that whiff of death you know i mean and yeah. it's only when he it's only when my character lets go of the thing that he's really trying to pursue uh, and uh, his ego is kind of smashed that he can find the solution. Right. And I, I, that is kind of the existential search you go on. Um, at least I do with those characters. Uh, right. You know, you have to have your butt kicked to kind of get to the truth, you know, in, in real life. You know, yeah. how many times is, is people, we have these ideas and it's, it's only when things massively fail that we readjust and we, if, if, if we're decent human beings, I mean, if we're criminals or whatever, we just make it worse. But if, if we've got any kind of conscience, we, we, we have to grow at that point and we have to find a deeper truth. And right. I, that's what you can do in a novel. You can do it in a crime novel. I do it in this fun novel. You know, he he eventually gets to the point then where he's got to change a lot of, he's got to, he's got to change his percept his his uh, his uh, bur the burning desire that he's had before, but he finds something that's much more valuable and right. he prevails. So. Awesome. See, I love that. I I love how that and that is found its way into. Um, you know, I like to say a fun sort of crime novel. So um, this again, this is Authors on the Air. I am Carrie Schaefer. I've been having the great pleasure of interviewing Lowell Caulfield. The book is below the line. It's out everywhere now where books are sold. I'm definitely going to be getting my hands on a copy. Um, thank you so much, Lowell. Um, I'm going to want to, you know, be watching for book two. And I hope that that uh, actually you're, you're uh, Blake. It's Blake, right? No, Edwin Eddie, 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 Edwin Blake. Blake. It, he's, it sounds like he's got his hooks in you and I know how that goes. So he will probably get his way and uh, hopefully there will be another book coming shortly. Carrie, I really appreciate it. It's been great uh, talking with you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.